Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. My name is Ed Piscor. And today we're going to look at the Blighted Eye original comic art from the Glenn Bray collection that Fanographics published, I don't know, four or five years ago in this massive, like 500 page, giant, thick, oversized hardcover. Jimmy, we on this channel, we've covered comics by noteworthy writers, comics by uh, impeccable draftsmen, um, journalistic excellence in certain comics, magazines, stuff that we've covered on the channel. But there are people out there who exist. We may have captured one of them in Jason Hamlin when we did the shoot interview with Hamlin, Jason Hamlin, the retailer to the stars. But there are these people who are like this. Warren Bernard would be another example. Thousand percent. Warren Bernard, another guy who has just like impeccable taste and has an amazing uh, library of stuff. There are these people who are custodians. They're like, they're like the watcher in Marvel Comics. You know what I'm saying? These are the custodians of, uh, of the art, you know, like they cherish this stuff and that is their contribution um, to kind of like take care of this material, to warehouse it, and to show it off every now and again. Yes. And I'm going to start diving into this, Ed. Please continue with this train of thought because it's the beginning of this. We're going to get some background on Glenn Bray in this collection. Um, and some of my notes in the beginning are about this. And, yeah. it, you know, he talks about who he's getting this stuff from early on. And it's names like Gary Arlington. It's also names like uh, George DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio's father, who made the documentary about the Polish sculptor Sokolski that recently came up on Netflix. And, you you know, you see those networks happen in, in, in the origins of this collection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was Glenn Bray who kind of, like, discovered the dude. And, and art kind of... Art is a scam. Like, the fine arts world is a scam. And there are tastemakers who give the thumbs up and thumbs down. It just so happens this guy kind of, like lucked into that position there there's there's an introduction here by robert williams mm -hmm. who describes the different kinds of collectors that are out there in the art world and comic world we'll say for the purposes yes. of cartoonist kayfabe and he described that there are the people there are the speculators there are the investment minded people who are trying to get you know slabbed comics to you know retire on and shit and then he describes the phenomenon which is a very it's a very rare thing and We've illustrated that we're very lucky to know some of these rare specimens, man. But it's the intuitive collector, a person who just has good fucking taste, which is conveniently cheap. You know, you can't buy it, but also very few people have it. I'm going to interrupt you for one second to point out this picture of Robert Williams and Basil Wolverton. Amazing. Um Something for people to note as we flip through is pay attention to the photos because there are going to be a lot of photos of artists next to their pieces, you know, which was part, I think, of the collecting process for Glenn Bray was getting to know some of these artists and some he becomes very close to, you know, Robert Williams writing this intro, Basil Wolverton and, and Harvey Kurtzman, both early guys that he collected and was super into and then had relationships with later on as, as life progressed. So... I think the photographs are a really nice piece of this. You're going to see all kinds of artists throughout this collection. And this is a, um, a little bit of background on the collection itself and how it's been used and seen and viewed by Todd Hignite, who we talked about in the, in the studio book. Uh, he's the guy behind Comic Art Magazine. And so, you know, another one of these people that do affect how we understand the comic arts market and does facilitate things like having this stuff reproduced. This book reminds me a little bit, I was talking to, somebody sent me some original Spain art scans this week. You know, we had, we had done a, a thing on Trash Man. And so he sent those and it makes me think like, wouldn't that be a great, great artist edition? This is kind of the underground comics artist edition, at least now, because this stuff is reproduced in super high quality for color reproductions. Um, so this is as good as we have for like a, a sampling, at least, of, of a lot of underground original art and there's more than just undergrounds in here but there's a big sample of it this is the glenn bray interview uh where he talks about the origins of, of his collecting and his history and i pulled out a couple of notes one he's interested in all types of imaginative visuals that's a quote 
Uh, so we'll see a little bit of that sampling. We, we mentioned the Polish sculptor that he championed. Um, he's a wrestling fan. So there's some other stuff. This is mostly focused on comics, but as a collector, that's not all that he collected. Uh, Wolverton, Wolverton and Kurtzman, um, early guys that he collected, and he talks about some of those things, like where he would find that stuff, early stores or bookstores that would have like a table of old comics, one place where you could bring in your own comics and trade like two for one for these just stacks of old comics. Um, pretty interesting. Said that he uh, he stopped buying old comics when Overstreet Price Guide was published in 1970. It kind of changed what he was doing because he was digging for weird stuff. You know, he was looking for those one pagers of Harvey Kurtzman in, you know, throwaway kind of comics, stuff that no, no other part of that comic is really noteworthy, but it would have one one page of one of these guys that he that he loved. One of the common grounds that a lot of people in early fandom have was um, they sort of abhor the Overstreet Price Guide and how it kind of changed their the the fandom of yeah. comics because now you now you do introduce the speculators uh, into the game when you see that certain comics are worth you know lots lots of money. Um, this is the Flintstones. This was like an amusement park. I went to this in 1999. Where is it? Uh, it's in the southwest somewhere, Arizona, New Mexico, something like that. But I was driving cross country and, you know, there's not, there, there are big stretches with nothing. So you'll see a sign for something and went to this and it is as desolate and like ridiculous as these pictures look. Just empty. You know, it was like two of us and maybe an employee or like a caretaker there. Really strange. Like a ghost town, except it's, it's Flintstone-y. I think it's since been shut down, but really strange. And so these are some of the other things that he collects. And he makes notes about, you know, it's basically tracing through his origins as a collector and what attracted him and things. We get into some of the, the start of the wrestling stuff. You see a hey look by Kurtzman there. Um, became friends with uh, Fred Blassie. You pencil net geek. Helped him record that album. Really? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, talks about that experience where they recorded that whole album in one day, some of it in one take. And, of course, it went on to live uh, on Dr. Demento's radio show for, for years and years. Um, but he talks about the wrestling stuff. And I think wrestling, again, is it, there's so much storytelling in wrestling that we can learn from. So kind of neat to see him uh, see that crossover. Gets into his collecting story origins, which are fun, and the undergrounds and how he came in contact with the undergrounds. That was another thing we mentioned when we were covering Spain is like what impact those could have had. And he talks about some of that. And I love hearing that. Like what's the actual effect when these are coming out? And it seems, you know, it's, it's mind bending. It changes you. If you get into those, you can't look at Marvel and DC the same way anymore. And of course, Mad Magazine, so much stuff goes back to it. One of the things that you'll uh, notice is that uh, very little uh, superhero yes. shit. And he says that, you know, he's not, he's not really a Kirby guy. This is pretty interesting because it traces like a lineage through, you know, from like the underground, from Mad and the undergrounds, but even getting into like all the way to the 90s. So like, you know, Panter, Klaus Hernandez brothers show up in the 80s. You have Raw and Weirdo, then you have Chris Ware. And so as he's describing it, he's saying there's no lag. You know, there, there's this been a very good flow of like new talent, interesting stuff all the way. And I, I like seeing that. That's that's uh, I agree with him, but it's cool to see it spelled out in an articulate fashion much more than I am doing here just to, uh, I don't know, give an appraisal of what that lineage of comics art is. Now, Glenn Bray, he was, you know, as far as I know, he like worked at his dad's hardware store. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if it's your dad's hardware store, well, maybe he's got big ducats, you know, and, and a lot of money, man. But that is one of those things where it's like, did this guy get all of this shit at just like a steal or, you know, does he just live super modestly and then spend, you know, all of his money on, you know, this very rare boutique shit, man. I mean, is that Carl Barks? It is Carl Barks. You know, that was another uh, person that he, he starts collecting early on. And we're going to see Carl Barks in here. We're going to see what is considered to be the oldest known Carl Barks duck art is in his collection. So it's a stupendous collection. He doesn't spell that out exactly, Ed, like how he's affording different things, but he does talk about different pieces and, and what they cost and things that he passed up or things that were affordable at the time. Um, you know, and some of it's pretty random how he gets hold of it. Like some, some art came through Gary Arlington, you know, so the people that he was involved with that he would visit every couple of weeks, every few weeks when he'd save up some money, they were all connected. It's not different than what we have now where we talk to cartoonists and we're trading info and secrets and things. 
there was a network back then. Uh, yeah, and it was called Fandom. And you see this you see this name right here, Bill Spicer. Bill Spicer was affiliated with uh, a lot of the big fanzines back in the day, man. Uh, notably, Squatrant, if I uh, remember correctly, man. So, like, the EC uh, Comics fans were freaking legion, man. And uh, that is that's a good place to start, you know, when you're when you're uh, in a collector's mentality. But I do want to make note of this uh, crazy uh, image right here of this uh, the, the the mule face lady because uh, somehow Drew Friedman got a hold of that photograph and did some cool stipple drawings of this photo. It's kitsch culture, you know, because that's that's freaks, that's freak show yeah. people, you know. There's Schlitzy the pinhead is there and. All of these old guys, like when you have three channels on TV, you have to search for yes. subversive culture, man. You have to really fucking dig. And there's still a limited amount of shit back then. Uh, they were all looking at the same stuff. Todd Browning freaks, probably all yeah. were jerking off to that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first things uh, that he would have done publicly is this Harvey Kurtzman in index. Wow. So this was, you know, applying the knowledge he had gained just from being a super fan for a couple of decades and then trying to make an index for people who were, you know, similarly Kurtzman fans. And it's it's interesting, you know, like it really does, this collection really seems to come out of Harvey Kurtzman, which would be EC and Mad and stuff, and Wolverton as like almost your starting points. And when you say Drew Friedman, I think Basil Wolverton. You know, like there is a pretty direct line from, from some of these artists as it goes out and gets into the more interesting stuff. But uh, correspondence with Kurtzman as a result of putting this together and uh, did not include a price list because he didn't want that. You know, that's, that's just not where his interests lied. Ideas on contemporary art and collecting. So again, there, there are some of the questions you pose are addressed. Uh, in this interview. Look at that, man. Old Slash <laughs> magazines, man. Some where Gary Panther's work first started showing up. And there are guys who he collected a lot of. Roy Hayes. There's a lot of Roy Hayes. S. Clay Wilson. He has a bunch of S. Clay Wilson, including like high school art from S. Clay Wilson, which is really cool and great that it's preserved somewhere. He's he's uh, well respected. Glenn Bray is very well respected uh, amongst the, the artists. And I mention that because there were shyster type characters men who who came in and, and bought a lot of the underground art for a big steal like there's you know some lawyer dude who bought binky brown for 500 bucks yeah. or some shit and that had to be wrangled from him like so glenn bray he's one of the good ones man i want to note this this is art credits so from all the stuff that we have seen up to this point is cataloged here as exactly what it is. This is, this is really put together like a like a legitimate art book which is great because if there's something that you would see and be like i need more of this or I want to know more, you know, it's, it's all, it's all annotated. Fanagraphics doesn't take any shorts, man. This is, this is a very well-designed book. It's an amazing, this book is, I can't think of how it could be any better. I, maybe if it were twice as big, but I mean, like, I, I'd need a crane to lift it if that were the case. Uh, it's pretty spectacular, great reproductions, but also all the annotations are very, very helpful. Yeah. So the other piece uh, to note as we go through here, this art is organized alphabetically by artist's last name. Oh, I didn't so pretty, realize. So pretty easy to look up something if, you know, if there's somebody that you want to go to. And who knows, if we run out of gas, maybe that's what we'll do is hit a few highlights. Um, so getting into Carl Barks, this is from a Walt Disney life drawing. You know, like they would have life drawing for staff artists and stuff. And so this is from one of those sessions correspondence it's really neat the stuff that he collects and then this is the piece that is uh the earliest original barks donald duck artwork known to exist 12 by 16 inches he was juiced in man like how the fuck did he do this and by the way i i've seen i've seen uh original barks pages and they are fucking gigantic yeah and you can see right here that they're sort of cut in half man or at least uh scored so that you could bend the paper this is uh, 24 and a half by 16 and a half. So we draw, you know, 11 by 17 is like a common comic book size. That's basically two of these. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a big, that's, that's awesome, man. Two panels at that size. Got to be stunning in person. So we'll keep going through. Ed, stop me if there's something you want to point out. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of art. There are a lot of artists in here that I don't know. Uh, interesting to look at, but the people I don't know, and I'm sure some of the, the people watching at home will recognize them and... Look, man, it's just too many to know everybody. Uh, but Mark Bayer, we certainly know well. And so you start to see his taste emerge. You know, whenever we were talking Basil Wolverton and Rory Hayes and, and some of these underground artists, Mark Bayer fits perfectly in there. Yeah, the cool th noteworthy thing here is I, I've never seen many of his pieces beyond 
comic strips. So that's well, a cool how one. about this? These comic strips are uh, 89 and 91. This is an early piece, 1973. Oh, so really, really uh, early, early piece. You know, like there's a lot of that stuff too that is kind of like maybe outside the the main body or what we know them for. You know, like I said, S. Clay Wilson, he has a big batch of his high school drawings. So you get to know these these guys, um, you know, these these collectors that that you respect. Like there's very few people that you would let through the door of your house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Hamlin would be one of those guys. Warren Bernard would be one of those guys. Uh you let them go through your archives, man. Uh Alvin Buena Vachora was that dude with with Klaus. Uh they you Whatever magic they have, they gain the respect of the pros. You could tell that they come from a from an honest place. I think I think that that's like how I intuitively figured out. You could keep keep. I figuring. wanted to point out this is Jack Bilbo. We're gonna see recreations by Dan Klaus, like where he does painting interpretations of these drawings later on, and they were in comic art and yeah. in the studio as well. I, I love this so much. This is a Charles Burns, and it's eleven eight and a half by eleven, so like a piece of photocopy paper of the book, and it sort of perfectly fits on there. I think that's really striking. But the humbug... And check this out. Like, these little washes, those, I think those would be indicators for the uh, color separator. This was an artist that was featured. A lot of this stuff was featured in comic art, the, the magazine. Yeah. And I know it's, you know, Todd Hignite talks about it in that intro. So, you know, it is because he was connected to Glenn Bray and would be exposed to this stuff. And they would have conversations about it. It was like, yep, that's that's worthy of like, let's show that to people. Let's talk about that. Let's get some, uh, a, a few more eyeballs on it. Al Cap doing his uh, his Dick Tracy, Fearless Fosdick impression. Two volumes of that came out from, uh, from uh, Kitchen, Kitchen, Sink? Kitchen Sink. And I highly recommend them, man. It's Al Cap cutting promos on <laughs> Eisner. I need to read those. Oh, it's so fun, man. <laughs> Getting into the Dan Klaus section, some choice pieces too, man, like eight ball covers. I, of course, I don't know what Klaus isn't choice, but again, you get the, the photos, you know, like it, it's not just I'm buying some artwork from you. It is, it is, uh, it, as you describe Ed with, say, a Hamlin or Warren Bernard in our case, it's building these relationships, you know, and you get to know each other and what you're interested in. I'm sure that Dan Klaus was probably over there looking at who knows Basil Wolverton himself, you know, or Kurtzman or Crum or whatever. Doing you know, it, the it exact, goes both ways. Doing the exact same stuff that you and I did when we go visit Warren. Or or the Billy Ireland, you know. I mean, if you go to Glen Bray, that's what you're seeing or, or potentially getting access to is this this incredible collection. So, and then doing there's a, several of these little personalized birthday cards or little drawings that, that an artist will do. <laughs> when you see something like this. That motherfucker paid Dan Klaus some money. Like, 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 he, like that motherfucker bought, bought some shit, man. Like, what, if, if you get a piece like that, man, that means that uh, he wants to keep that connection going. Yeah, look at the lettering's perfect. Like, like you're not dashing that off. Check out how much this is yellowed from, from like a velvet glove cast in iron early eight ball story. But man, like, whatever was in that adhesive. Not, not archival. It's probably eaten through the paper at this point. <laughs> Album cover. So. And these are the Jack Bilbo painting, you know, recreations from like the, the original drawing and then Klaus doing a, a painting. Yeah, it makes you wonder, man. And if we get Klaus on the channel, it's like, did you discover this Jack Bilbo guy like because of Glenn Bray? Yeah, could be. Very much could be. This is neat. This is Jack Cole, uh, widely known as the creator of Plastic Man, great cartoonist, but man, that guy was, he could do everything. Yeah. And so he had a whole body of work of, of this kind of, cheesecake pinup uh, stuff right stuff you might find in playboy magazine and in fact i think i think he did do work for playboy magazine so it's a whole body of work and just an outstanding artist this is interesting this is uh this is still jack cole but it reminds me again of charles burns it seems like a similar sensibility of looking at these iconic arch archetypal genre comic styles except it was done you know in the moment so maybe there's no irony there Coop. Now getting into the Robert Crumb section, and you see Glenn Bray with Robert Crumb. So again, in addition to buying some artwork, I assume relationships are built over time. And especially if you have a big body of work, you're interacting with the person a lot. And I assume that he was interested, you know, just in in the time period. Like, hey, you know, Crumb, tell me his tell me firsthand accounts of this this era because he collects a lot of underground comics from this time period and talks about it in that interview early on. So. Obviously, a very influential time period. Ooh, Jack Davis, baby. 
These are neat. These are card art and they're three and a half by two and a half inches. So really tiny drawings whenever you think about what some some of the Jack Davis stuff would be. Davis is known for speed. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a guy who could turn a uh, Tales from the Crypt story around in a day and a half. Uh, so he was, you know, dashing these things out and he could, he's, he's a compulsive drawer. These are some nice pieces, man. You know, like, like, like the cards are something, but, but some of these like more finished big paintings. Wow. Yeah. We had, we saw some of those in the Billy Ireland. Gene Deitch, you know, who, who recently passed away, um, a tremendous visual artist, really great cartoonist. And you see pieces of his work pop up in different things from animation archives to comics, you know, did a comic strip for a while, really attractive style. And then of course the father of Kim Deitch, another very noteworthy underground. It's date of birth on Gene. Uh, 1924. 1944, like these guys, you know, we recently lost Gene, but they were so close in age that uh, it, it was almost like big brother. Yeah, yeah, it really would be, especially at this, you know, once you're, you're both adults, like, that just isn't much difference 20 years. Kim Deitch color work is pretty neat to see. Love this stuff. You can see he's drawing on, like, graph paper. You can see a little bit of graph ruling behind it. Yeah, I wonder what that is. Like, there, a lot of guys use, use that kind of... Uh, paper so it's like a bristol it's like you know it's a very sturdy board that has blue line uh you know pre-printed on it uh, i've just never seen that stuff and i bet it just hasn't existed for probably 35 40 years yeah you're probably right about that um there used to be so much in the way of like paper and ink stuff you know you, you could buy it at every drugstore and things and it's just that's a bygone era man we're not we're not getting that one back Simon Deitch. These are beautiful. And I, I guess that's his brother. Can't sleep on Simon. But I love these pencil drawings. Can't, really nice. Can't sleep on Simon, man. I encourage everybody to go out and get uh, issues of Mineshaft that show off a lot of Simon Deitch uh, artwork. Uh, apparently there wasn't enough stuff for him to collect, Glenn Bray, so he starts commissioning people to do drawings of the devil. And this is uh, several pages of, you know, different artists and then, you know, calling out who it is. But they're like postcard size devil commissions. Drew Friedman having to be uh, the best of the bunch, stand out, gets a little... This is what happens when you put that extra in. You get the nice big reproduction. <laughs> and that's probably two size, this piece right yeah, here. Yeah, it could be. But it is a who's who, man. Just big, huge artists that are, that are part of these collections. And this is the part where the art snobs are like, they're not even stopping to talk about those dudes. I'm sure we're skipping a lot, but we'll be skipping some cartoonists too. Interesting stories too. A lot of the annotations, in addition to just the technical specs, will have some information. So this is an artist that he collected a few pieces from, from the artist's son, because the artist had passed away. Mm -hmm. And so when he died, a big collection of pornography was discovered, pornographic drawings. And uh, that's who he bought this from, his son. <laughs> And so he had dinner with him in Paris and, and, you know, conversation about this. And the son, you know, he says he, had, he, had, he wasn't embarrassed by it at all. They ultimately published a collection of this work. Uh, but it's just interesting stories of how he gets connected to some of these different pieces. Jimmy, I think you should draw some shit like this and just kind of like scroll it away. Now, I want you to live a very nice, long, full mm -hmm. and happy life. But say, say you go before your wife. I wanted to find a bunch of these hidden drawings that you do with. That is the funniest <laughs> trick you could play on someone. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Elder, man, playing with some duotone board, man. And see, Glenn Bray, he has respect for the material because this is not light fast. Uh, duotone will sort of dissolve and, and go away if you do not store the, the work properly. And this is about as good as it could possibly look after 70 years of storage. Oh, Elder's such a fucking badass, man. Incredible. Incredible and choice pieces, man. Covers, paintings. Look he, at that painting. He had to buy this from Russ Cochran, I think. I think Cochran had... A, or, uh, you know, from Bill Gaines by way of Russ Cochran. And that would have been like the Squatrant uh, kind of thing. But, but Elder was known... You know, he went to one of those art high schools, like the fame school, you know? And he was known for being just like a virtue... Uh, 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 um, uh, uh, what the fuck? A virtuoso artist this is where you get to see like the the bill elder chicken fat what a prime page and this would have been the uh, end papers i believe for the big mad uh artist edition which is perfect 
We'll have to go through that thing sometime. This is neat to me because think of how big those lines are. You know, this is giant, like the two up original stuff. So giant piece and then just these huge black lines. Really bold choice whenever you think like this is what he's getting, you know, what he's known for. But this concept calls for this different approach. Right. And 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 like it it works for this. Uh, no problem. But the, the stuff that really like blows my mind kind of kind of more uh, going down that same path is like the Kurtzman cartooning that would have these like super bold lines that to me, I would have no confidence in myself. I would feel like I'm being too heavy handed or something. But Kurtzman did not have those issues. These are pretty damn amazing, too. And I can't figure out like how he's getting the grayscale there. If those if that's it can't be duo shade, right? No, it's not. It's probably, uh, if it's not ink wash or something, it, it might be like a black gouache or something like that. Yeah, it's hard to tell with that small piece, but it looks like there are patterns in there. Um, and amazing that you can go from this to this. Vince Fago. So I went through a funny animal comics phase at one point, and that's mostly late golden age, very early silver age is whenever that was a popular genre. But uh, Fago was, is like the guy. At least that's who Bill, Bill from Copacetic pointed me at, at this artist and some of his uh, comics. I like, I like uh, Feldstein, his work, and I bet he has more Feldstein. You could probably keep going. But um, Feldstein's work... This is your story, Ed. Compared to, uh, <laughs> compared to all of the other EC artists, he stands out because it's so, and I say this lovingly, generic looking, uh, cold... Uh, the cartoony part of it, it looks plastic, mm -hmm. but it's no less sinister. Like this, it, it looks like the art of a psychopath or something. It reminds me a little bit of almost a uh, a bridge between the very illustrative EC guys versus like the Harvey Kurtzman more graphic piece. You know, it's almost like this in between, you know, because it has some of these bigger outlines and things. Unfortunately, th to me, this is his worst piece that that Feldstein never drew it was for like the trade paperback uh or what you know these collections but uh that's not the greatest example of his work but I love seeing the photos there. of all these old time cartoonists too because you just don't see them mm -hmm. you know it, it's not like today where we're all on video and photos and you know everywhere you, you can find a million images of some average cartoonist today but like these old timers it's special whenever you actually get to see them I got to eat lunch with uh, Feldstein at the Pittsburgh no Comic Con way. last time yeah. that's awesome yeah yeah uh, Virgil Finley, one of the great illustrator, sci-fi illustrator types. I don't think he has too much Finley stuff. Um, I'm glad he has a pen and ink piece. But it is it does come up in the uh, interview in the beginning. Like he does talk about how he got these and how he connected to them. Kelly Freeze, famous uh, Mad cover artist. Oh, the man. Big Drew Friedman section, and again, this is somebody I'm going to speculate, but there's got to be a lot of interest crossover between he and Glenn Bray. Like to be a fly on the wall whenever those dudes are hanging out. This is my introduction to Drew Friedman's work. It was in uh, volume uh, two, number two of Raw Magazine. And uh, when I saw this, like, I just could not reverse engineer it because I couldn't wrap my mind around the idea of somebody actually just like putting dots on a piece of paper to get that. I, it just sounded insurmountable, totally impossible. But uh, that's how it's done. Here it is, man. It's the fucking original art. One, one, a couple things on this. Mostly it's all the dots, right? But he breaks that a couple times, like when he's doing the liquid effect, really good, or solid blacks, like for the sky. These are uh, little things that'll really push this effect over the top. Charles Burns will do that sometimes, where it's like mostly it's that beautiful feathering, but then now and then you'll get some other texture that's applied on top, and it really, really can make things pop. And look at this, like he'll, he'll lay down, you know, there are no absolute blacks, there are no absolute whites, so he'll lay down black ink here, and then have white stipple dots to just make it like a 99% gray yeah, value. Amazing. This is uh, Bella Lugosi. Th this was where he was last filmed. This is Tor Johnson's house. So this is from Plan 9 from Outer Space, if you've seen that, where he's coming out of the front door. Karloff, sidekick, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Boy, that's funny. So, Comic shop clerks. These are choice pieces, man. So much Drew Friedman. These are the iconic pieces. You know what I'm saying, man? Like fucking Leo Gorsi. Every time I go over to my dad's crib, man, he's watching Bowery Boys. <laughs> Joey Heatherton. Wow. Duplex Planet cover. Zachary the Cool Ghoul. Every, all the old timers that I kick it with, man, talk about Zachary the Cool Ghoul. If they're from New York or New Jersey. He was like a horror host. Oh, interesting. Here, here in Pittsburgh, we had uh, Chili Billy Cardilli, who was the WPXI weatherman. Yeah. Also seen in uh, Night of the Living Dead, one of the reporters there. 
That's a great piece. Um, pretty cool there, Friedman holding a Basil Wolverton drawing. So again, like the photos are pretty rich in their own right. This is where I'm going to be ignorant and just go buy like a nice body of work here. <laughs> Obviously, somebody significant that I just don't know well. Listen, man, it's called cartoonist kayfabe. He has international representation as well. Um, you know, several of these artists are European. It's it's a it's incredible the collection that he put together. Oh, Chester Gold piece. What year is this one? Does it say forty four? Is that a prime uh... prime period for sure? I'm all, I always admire when you see the the Dick Tracy stuff how sharp the inks are. Really giant too. So Justin Green, Binky Brown, you mentioned in the in the beginning here. One of the first uh, auto bio comics, maybe the first artist edition comic, is reproduction of some of this material. Yes. Well, some of this material. Yes. And uh, cover, you, no less. Because because that lawyer guy swooped in and took all all the other interior pages. Man, it's so informative to see to be able to see work like this, just to see all the different hatching and processes that are on display there. Oh man, That's what a resource! Pinky Brown piece. Yeah, I think this one is too, page 38. Oh, that, I mean, this is the one. This is like the one that you, people remember, the little dick feet <laughs> and the dick fingers and stuff. Does it have dick fingers? I can't tell. This yeah, yeah, away. yeah. <laughs> fingers. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is the memorable page. We saw some of this artist somewhere. I can't remember where, but I, I know that we've looked at this in something. It might have been in the comic art issue. Rick Griffin. Uh, there was a Rick Griffin poster in the back of the Tim Truman interview. Hanging on a wall. Mm, yes. He's a name that comes up a lot. You know, again, another one of these underground guys. Super graphic. Great lettering. But just, I don't know, just a visual virtuoso. You know, Ed, as you had said earlier, like a guy whose work is just huge. And high, highly influential yeah. to, to so many people that tra it transcends comics. You know, like a lot of album cover art. Synonymous it with that like 60s, 70s post west coast poster art style yeah yeah you'll you'll see stuff and then it'll be like is that rick griffin it doesn't feel right then you look close and it is somebody biting his style these are great though man all these pieces are just beautiful i love this kind of stuff too every now and then i'll see like an artist that will have they'll, they'll be selling little illustration pieces or whatever and it's this kind of stuff and sometimes that's my favorite stuff is just a logo a small drawing a, a repair this is kind of neat uh griffin had left his pen <laughs> left the pen there and so i think this is I don't know if this is all, I feel like this may be like all one big piece put together um, on display as part of it, but it's kind of neat. I always like whenever we see like the tools. It was cool Tim Truman showed off that pen. <laughs> and and he, he he has it mounted to like, we ain't playing, you know, yeah. like this is, this is real, this is real life. This is our culture. It, it is. It's, there's a, there's a quality to these objects, a power that they have. Lots of Griffin. Yeah, I think they're close. And I think these guys do, you know, it's part of that network. You know, at some point you become friends and at some point you are looking out for each other and being like, do you know this guy's stuff? Have you seen this yet? It ha happens so naturally, yes. too. You can't force that. A little Matt Groening, getting a Griffey. Yeah, this is cool. So this is the Rory Hayes story. If you have the, I think Fanographics put out the one Rory Hayes collection and this is in there. It's Bill Griffith, you know, telling this story, but kind of a nice piece, especially if you're into Rory Hayes. Like Bill, or, or like uh, Glenn Bray is. Milk Gross. It's kind of cool to see a Milk Gross piece. <laughs> it's a weird piece, but it's neat to have him in here. He has weird pieces, man. Is that Al Columbia? Mm-mm. Oh. I don't know. Harmon Icing Productions, so from the 1930s. This would be like vintage, you know, whatever it is. That's the original kind yeah. of thing. Um, this is neat because you could put it with like Jim Woodring. You know, you could almost pull out pieces from this this book and make sub collections that are thematically related or visually related. That's just bizarre, but there are other pieces that it would fit in. So now we're getting into some Rory Hayes stuff. We're going to have to look at him at some point. Cause I like his work a lot. Yeah. Uh, but a, a nice collection. And I would bet this comes out of like the Gary Arlington, uh, you know, being connected to Gary Arlington early in the collection and being exposed, you know, very closely to that underground, those underground roots. Cause I think Rory Hayes may have worked for Gary Arlington for a little bit. I might be wrong on that, but I feel like he was around there. Oh, yeah, for sure. Look at how... Just an original cartoonist. Even in, in the world of underground comics where everybody's somewhat original, 
this dude sort of stands out. And these guys, like all the undergrounders, uh, loved and respected him, man. When you and I, last time you and I were at the Billy Ireland, uh, they acquired the Jay Lynch archives and what was sitting at the top of the pile, but a bunch of Rory Hayes artwork, man. This is really interesting. So this is one of his iconic stories. It's from Boogeyman 1 is probably the most known Rory Hayes comic. So there's your ink ready for reproduction original, but here's like a pencil I don't know, like mock-up or plan or something, you know? It's not like this is inked over. You can see the lettering and stuff is a little bit different. It's a little bit different, but it's it's a very detailed pencil drawing that then you redrew. <laughs> he would do this, the Dolls Weekly, as a kid. So these are like middle school comics that he made. And there's a collection of that stuff that Picture Book put out. Picture Box. Picture Box. And, uh, and Ray has some of that stuff too. So I always love the kid comic stuff. And it's interesting to see it because he did a lot of them, like a dozen issues, and they evolve. Like by the end, it's like, this dude's real good. Russ Heath. Gotta love Russ Heath. Yeah, one of his few uh, mad stories, man. I wondered about that because I don't think of him as, as a mad artist, but these are mad pieces. And he's got the great page too, man, where he he grabs Plastic Man's arm, <laughs> sucks it to create an air bubble, and pops it. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite pages, man. Wow. That's so funny. It's so atypical of Russ Heath, but it's perfect. It's Russ Heath would do uh, humor. He did a lot of work in uh, National Lampoon that where he's kind of playing off of his realistic like uh, art, uh, art military comics and, and uh, Western comics, but they were funny, funny yeah. books. So obviously, uh, when you're teamed up doing work over top of the roughs of Harvey Kurtzman, man, your comedic timing is going to be on point. It was a good match. It really fits. And you can see the contrast of how else he could work. He sticks He sticks with Kurtzman a lot. It's almost yeah. like he just inks the Kurtzman pencils. Yeah, it's an interesting approach. The greatest of the Jaime Hernandez. <laughs> the best of the best. Absolutely, man. Like, that is the iconic cover uh, after, you know, issue number one. Uh, Two-color cover. Black on red. Um, so much spirit is in there, man. Like, so Movement. much attitude. It's flawless. And there's a little bit of a, there's a quote from Jaime here, a little bit about it and saying, I think it was uh, late or something. So he had to turn it out very quickly. And he said he started with the left foot and then just drew from there, which uh, was, was usually the opposite for him, which I guess means he usually starts with the right foot. Look at the positioning. It's uh, incredible you know, that, that it twist. Totally feels it. He, Jaime credits, uh, you know, he went to like a community college for, for, you know, a semester or something like that. And he said there were like grizzled old vets, man, who taught like the life drawing class. He said he learned more there than, than, you know, a lifetime of drawing comics when he was growing up and he still holds a lot of those lessons, uh, carries those lessons with him to this day a big part of what just you know from dinners and shit he sort of would stress the idea of like you pencil the thing and you forget about it for, like you put it down for a while you you come back later you do not pencil something and then ink it because you got to fix that shit man you're going to see it with fresh eyes and you're going to be able to add some body weight to these characters and stuff that's interesting it's interesting to think of learning figure drawing that way where it's a very, uh, like a concrete thing rather than more subjective art, you know, because figure drawing is anatomy. Like it could be taught in a very concrete, I, I miss, solid way. I miss the guy, like from the lessons that he learned from those guys, it was an interview probably in a uh, comic book art or com the comic artist magazine that uh, John B. Cook does, but it's like, draw the head last. And that was a revelation to me, man. That's interesting. That was such a revelation. I haven't heard that before. That's good. Wow. Because everybody draws the head first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, more Jaime, including a little Fred Blassie uh, portrait, probably for, for Bray, I guess, but just little, uh, four and a half by three and a half inches. And then we're going to transition into Harriman, a couple of, couple of pieces of Harriman, not a lot, but just having Jaime Hernandez and George Harriman on the same page. What a page. <laughs> Makes me giddy as a fan. Totally. And he's got a big one, man. He's got a Sunday. Yeah. This is mentioned. He details how he got this. I think this was $200, which would have been a good bit early on, like maybe in the seventies, he picked that up, but, but an early piece that he got. Um, and he talks about in the interview. So again, some of these questions about collecting are answered. Al Hirschfeld piece. This is interesting. I always think of him as great with pen and ink and line. So getting a color piece is a little bit different, but still you get that fabulous line. Look at like that. What an ink line. You can find on YouTube, you can find a video of, of Hirschfeld doing some drawing. Yeah. And it, it is hypnotic. 
kind of uses a pen nib in a way that I don't think you should. Like, he pushes a pen nib sometimes in some of those videos in ways that I think you can't do, except, of course, he does, and he did for, like, 100 years. Yeah, draw, draw for 90 years, and you'll figure it out. <laughs> it is unique. Um, Lawrence Hubbard, man, real deal. We haven't gotten to real deal in, in great detail yet on this channel, but definitely one of those, like, outsider, self-publishing, badass, outlaw artists uh, from the L.A., you know, from, from that area, and... Uh, makes sense that he would find him raw dog himself man i was actually thinking shoot interview might be imminent with uh the great raw dog yeah i'd be interested to talk to him because i i'm a fan of his work and it's it's great to see that represented here this is from the 90s so you know a big wide range of, of we've caught out pieces from the 30s now all the way up to the 90s and i'm sure there's stuff that's older and newer Ooh, ghastly grim angles what do you know about him he, he's one of the ec guys that i have least personally connected to his work but seems like a horror maestro, right? Oh, definitely, man. Great lighting, uh, known for the gothic uh, sort of stories, principal artist on Haunt of Fear, and everything fucking looked wet. Uh, that's like the best way I can describe <laughs> that's it. That's a good the, description. It's just like it all looks drippy and wet. Huge influence on Bernie Wrightson. That's exactly what I'm seeing in, in that feathering and stuff. Yeah, draws. He, he, you could not... If you held a gun to the dude's head, he couldn't draw an attractive person to save his life, man. <laughs> uh, but then there would be this kind of shit, too, with, like, candles sticking out of every orifice. There's the one uh, cover for Haunt of Fear number 18 or something with, like, the little men who are whose bodies are hands and shit like that. And they're crawling around and vulture uh, guys with human heads with vulture bodies. That comes that's inspired uh, the 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 anti-man or uni-man or whatever that Bernie Wrightson creates for Swamp Thing yeah. or direct results from just that cover. Like, That's those awesome. things ain't even in, in a story. Daniel Johnson drawing somebody that we have talked about on this channel. Some of the stuff that I don't know is some of the most compelling stuff. I find myself lingering on some of these images. Well, I don't know this artist, and he has several of this artist, Oda Kaidi, Kidi? I don't know if that's a Japanese name. Um, interesting art, and like I said, he has several pieces, so I, I don't know if that's a West Coast artist or something else, how he came in contact with him. Catching him king, man. Another strong page. Nice pedigree. Bernie Kriegstein, including this thing. This is such a masterpiece, man. I always think of the Squat Trant issue that this is the cover of. Um, it's like, it's a monster fight. It's brilliant. It's such a great visual depiction of cockfighting. It's so graphic. Yeah, man. Kriegstein is an EC guy that I connect to. Uh, sometimes he's my favorite EC guy. You know, like he just does stuff that nobody else in comics does before and, or after. And one of the things just technically is he's ganging up Mm -hmm. the zipatones which is a very dicey proposition yeah you know this could and you could see there's more right here and i'm sure in that old shitty offset printing of your probably barely turned out but graphically as an original piece uh it holds up it looks really fucking cool man he was so great at varying line weights so you get these like really tiny little lines next to like things that you know like look at the weight of the line on that next to then these little tiny feather lines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's clear use of pen and brush, and he's slinging both. You know, I'm imagining him, you know, with the uh, with the pen in, in between yeah, the, a couple the Joe fingers. Kubert, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Freddy Krueger hands. <laughs> the bringing up Father the Mad story that he did, those are some choice pages to have, but this is such an iconic piece in my mind. Really strong work. Very awesome. And now getting into the Harvey Kurtzman section which could probably be a book in itself because it is like a, a very wide range representing a lot of Kurtzman's, uh, you know, stuff from, from most of Kurtzman's life. It's a fucking rough for mad number one. What must that be worth? It's, like, it's like, got to be five figures at the very least. At the very least. I mean, it's one of the most important pieces probably in the history of comics. And it looks beautiful in color like that. Stunning. Ten, ten by seven and a half inches. So smaller than a piece of photocopy paper you know probably i'm trying to figure out like it might be actual size right here so that's pretty awesome if it is and it wouldn't surprise me uh again the guys who put this book together are smart people it wouldn't surprise me if they recognize we could make we could reproduce this at size but that's not these all roughs, folks these roughs are <laughs> more so roughs cool. 
and this and this is so great. This is such a great story, man, with the uh the face on the floor. It's like the first it's like, hello, Basil Wolverton in the house, man. I think it's the first Wolverton uh mad art. And it's just this like gnarly face that can be spotted in the wood grain of the floor. <laughs> and everybody kinda it's almost like those Virgin Mary sightings or something like that. Except <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, the hyena girl. Dude, look at what these are, man. This is like, this is cover for issue six. Yeah. This is the cover, you know, like the finished cover art from this concept piece. Yeah, this is a cover. <sighs> man, just heavyweight shit. I do love these roughs, though. Kurtzman's so roughs, bright yeah. color. Kurtzman's roughs are um, standout stuff. Yeah, with like paste ups and, and mechanicals. And... This stuff makes me happy looking at it. I, think of all the art that has not survived. So being able to see any of this stuff, like you can't take it for granted. It's it's great that this stuff is still around. The finished art for this piece right here in Humbug is incredible. It's a Bill Elder piece, man. And there are so many more people here. And the lighting gets like that Goodman Beaver line. You know, like the Jim Woodring yeah. kind of like taper line with the thick and thins, man. I love all the margin notes. Really exciting. And this is the Bijou 8 color oh, key so it is. And, uh, and, and cover. So it is, man. That's a awesome. Another video that we've looked at here. So... Uh track that thing down if you Help. haven't seen it like it's it's like little snippets of of kurtzman's body of work man hey these are that blue line grid and you'll see it's it's custom paper like they they had this stuff printed for humbug so who knows like some of that stuff whenever you see the grids you know it could be coming from the from the publisher humbug was a very odd size it was smaller than mm -hmm. than your pamphlet comic and i imagine that they had to keep keep those artists on the rails man this is invaluable oh jeez. talk about iconic and see these are uh the color holds those little red those little red pen marks like those would not be delineated with line but with color and it would be a note to probably marie severin when she's preparing the guides and then the engraver the printer engraver would have to cut the color separations along those red lines i don't know how they make those lines go away in yeah, the I, don't know. I i think it must have to do with like a high contrast reproduction or something but red is tough because red is essentially black when it's hit with light you know it absorbs light mm. so that's a really hard line to get rid of I, I wanna, like blue you can sort of get out in the photo but they always use red. red yeah they always use red too uh so so i would like to ask one of the grizzled vets man who know about such things how they get that red line out of there this is great this is super like an artist edition where you get to see like all the pasted up text being discolored and things such an odd uh conceit too man like when humbug comes out where it's like it's a more respectable magazine so we have to use mechanical typography for the lettering but kurtzman Poo pooed that during his EC days when he chose Ben Oda to do the le the lettering on all of his comics yeah. and stories, including stories that he would do in Tales from the Crypt, amongst all the other Leroy lettered stuff. So it's it's almost like selling out or some shit, man, to try to like pass on the newsstand as being sophisticated. Well, it worked for the New Yorker, you know. That's that's the only thing I could think about. Yeah, it's a, that's an interesting note. I don't have much to add to it. I think you're right. I think that is like the code of like, this is for adults versus the hand lettering is just for kids or all ages or something. Love seeing these pieces too, that are still comics, but a different, I guess, going for a more sophisticated audience, right? You pair certain things down. It's probably reflective of some of the time and trends and illustration, but it's cool to see these different phases that he goes through. And then this is great. You know, this is, this is almost like the, Hey, look, era yeah those one page throwaways and i've seen that discussed in different places where those were pages that nobody wanted you know it was like we need to fill a page we didn't sell an ad or whatever and he jumped at it at the time because he just wanted to make comics and so that was what was available while most people thought that was terrible he looked at it as opportunity and we continue to see them decades and decades later so i always think that's an inspiring story for just taking advantage of whatever opportunity you have and mm -hmm. if you're great you know, you can be great in those one pages. Such a great Kurtzman representation here. Great Bobby London, one of the air pirates, eventually uh, took over the Popeye strip in like the 80s. Unbelievable how 
strong these are as like a Harriman riff. Totally, totally. He was he was good at that shit, man. Doing those kinds of riffs. This is another piece where you could pull out some of those, group them together with the Jim Woodring graphite images. Jay Lynch. Yeah, my, fir my first collaborator, man. The, the dude who brought me into the game. You know, the whimsical guru of comics. Pretty neat. Uh, from 1968 to 2008, I think this is the 2008 piece, a birthday card, but still kind of the same stylistic ability. Oh, man. Like, I mean, I, I, you know, I knew Jay up to his death and, and that same Mineshaft magazine, like he did some covers for that and the artwork did not get chinsed out. That is such a uh, important thing to see, artists that hold on to that technical ability. Yeah. It's, going the it, other it's way... It's really hopeful for me. <laughs> going the other way as well, it, uh, you would have like Charles Schultz and also Osama Tezuka who would lament that stuff. But to you or I, the work still looked good. So hold on to that just in case if the yeah. hand gets shaky or something, man. Like everybody else will still dig it. Some Don Martin pieces there. See, this is an artist I don't know, but it looks like it's substantial. Mike Mignola. Such a broad collection. Not too many books where you're going to see Jay Lynch and Mike Mignola on uh, a couple pages away from each other. Getting into Gary Panter. I think there's a good bit of Panter in here. Uh, some of the Zombo comics mm -hmm. covers. Love seeing like the way he's building pages and artwork. It'd be fun to just hear Glenn Bray talk about these different artists. Because like a Gary Panther that he has, you know, any of these people that he has a big set of their art, just to hear him opine on it. You know, because oh, it's so broad, just the Gary Panther that we're seeing here, from paintings to strips to underground or, or you know, alternative comics, early alternative comics, like those flyers. Like, it's a broad range. It'd be great to hear him weigh in on it. Ah, uh, this is like uh, one of the pages or like the... Interior cover to the corrugated cardboard. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, raw one shot. Glenn Bray's still around, right? As far as I know. I think so, too. Um, I'm going to have to reach out. I'm going to have to try to find that guy. Yeah, I bet you you could talk to him for about a week. Yeah, yeah. We could see, we'll see if he knows how to use Zoom. <laughs> yeah. You know what? His, his Panther collection is much more substantial than I realized. And choice pieces, man. Some of this Jimbo stuff, like, wow. That's from the Pantheon uh, Jimbo collection. Ah, I dig. Really, really impressive. This is this is uh, Young Panther. This is from the 80s. So Gary Panther photos from the 80s. That's fun, too. You see him on social media and stuff now. I love these like photos, man. They're some of my favorite things going, getting into this. Virgil Parch, cartoonist I like a lot. And he has a bunch of these drawings in here. And I was just looking at these, like, prepping for this. This is another one like that Al, Al Hirschfeld line, where you just look at these lines, just study the lines, you yeah. know? Like, it's such a drawer. Yeah, I don't know if this is a myth or urban legend, but the idea, it's put out there that, you know, Virgil Parch had that uh, regular strip mm -hmm. in a newspaper. What was it? Was it called VIP? Maybe. I, I can't remember the name of it, but I know, I know the strip. He, he worked so relentlessly on it, and was so sort of filled with anxiety over the deadlines that when he passed, there was still like several years worth of strips to go that have not seen the light of day. I think that's a true story. I think I've read that in, in one of the Virgil Parch books. I, I believe that's uh, accurate. The number in my mind that I remember was three years worth of strips, but that could be wrong. Savage Pencil. I think we saw Savage Pencil in the in the studio stuff of uh, Gary Panter. We also saw it in the uh, Narrative Corpse episode that we did. British cartoonist, if I remember correctly. Yeah, pretty good collection of his work. <laughs> Just a drawer, man. Yeah, and you see who, who sort of like spins off from that in our modern day. Guys like the J.J. Villard or Skinner or like that kind of that brand of artwork. A lot of uh, Fort Thunder stuff in some of some Definitely. of it. Not all of the Savage Pencil, but something like this that's so mark-making and, and covering the page. So this is Norman Pettingill, who I learned about from Comic Art Magazine, I'm pretty sure. I think it was that, not Comics Journal. And then there was like a collection of his work uh, put out that I think had like wooden book covers on, on the edges or something. You know, really nice collection, but outsider artist. And pretty fascinating, like clearly 
from a cartoon tradition, but not something that I knew of before this. And I assume it comes from Glenn Bray. You know, especially if it came out of Comic Art Magazine, it probably comes from this. Peter Pontiac, man, somebody I don't know much about at all. He gets the cover of the book, you know? That's the rough for the cover piece. Yeah, I don't I don't know his stuff either, um, but a good bit of it in this collection, and, like, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's a really stunning page. <laughs> I feel like uh, we did picks wrong here. <laughs> somebody needed to license this image. Uh... <laughs> yeah, this stuff's great. And it reminds me, this, there's a big collection of this art it reminds me of spain sure really beautiful work though i don't know if this stuff was like standalone art or what i should have researched him more since there's it's such a big part of the book yeah yeah if i want to look at art i'll go to the museum <laughs> give me some more comic looking shit I think that's a neat piece. Reminds me of that raw 80s alternative stuff. Johnny Ryan, uh, they talk about contemporary cartoonists that he likes, and Johnny Ryan's one of the names that he that he cites. It's it's like it's like he uh Glenn Bray is like one of those like a NBA talent scout or like like the publisher should just like listen to him or something, man. Like like see where he goes at San Diego Comic Convention, follow behind and uh give the kids he talks to. Uh, some sort of publishing contract or some shit. Johnny Ryan is such an interesting cartoonist, and part of it is just how much work he produces. Like, he's constantly drawing. He has that gene, whatever that is, of, like, it's got to get out. You know, it's like an energy that can't be can't be stopped. So pretty cool to see him as part of the... Part of the big, Glenn Bray recognizing that. Big-time idea, man. Uh, great uh, Instagram for my, as far as I could tell, he's like grandfathered in after all this cancel culture bullshit <laughs> where nobody even fucks with him. And it's just like, well, that's just Johnny Ryan. He just does his thing, man. But I consider Johnny to be like, he's the last guy of like that era of Fantagraphics, you know, like that 90s era. Yeah. When, when Angry Youth Comics started getting published by Fantagraphics, there wasn't like a new Fantagraphics comic that was like a regular series that came out from them that had the gravitas of like oh, yeah. the eight balls and the black holes. It, it was Angry Youth and it was like, all right, there's a new kid on the block. Made me feel like I should start submitting. She's like, oh man, they're, they're accepting uh, submissions or some shit. Yeah. New cartoonist, but legitimate in the roots of cartooning and especially subversive cartooning. He's, you know, what's, what's also great is he's working on like, Tom and Jerry cartoons or something now, like like so some of that classic like Looney Tunes. It makes sense. Fuck. You can't do what he does without having that uh, that ability, that understanding, that history part of it, because it's so steeped in the language of comics. What he does, it's it really it, like language of comics. Johnny Ryan's a guy you can look at. Yeah, it's just it's just uh, noteworthy that they accept him. That part is surprising. <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't want to skip Jim Shaw. You know, great artist in his own right, and I like I, I like this kind of art where it's. Uh, comics adjacent it's using again language of comics but maybe in a new way and some of these are like ideas he would dream about so an eight ball cover by him from from his dreams and i just think as a drawing this is a really nice piece and then gilbert shelton another underground legend yeah wonder warthog pieces man and uh these could be these could be a part of a greater whole that would have to do with like the kurtzman shit man because wonder warthog appeared in help magazine i don't know if these pages specifically but certainly the earliest wonder warthog uh, appearances were in there and i bet that's where bray first saw yeah could uh, be. his shelton he was a guy when i started looking for like al alternative and underground stuff that stood out to me you know like the graphic quality of his cartooning very easy to understand i think mark smeets was in the gansfield profiled in the gansfield an issue i'll take your word for it um spain love his originals <laughs> that's incredible yeah same with the color stuff it's really nice to see the color stuff photos of vintage spain <laughs> you don't want to fuck with that guy like cartoonists were actually not punks back in the day yeah it's 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 living your gimmick <laughs> cliff starrett polly and her, and her pals you swart This is that Polish sculptor, Stanislav Sukolski. So 
also some drawings and uh, two-dimensional work of his. And there's been a book published um, of his sculpture work. And Glenn Bray was instrumental in bringing this guy sort of a, a, a second wave of interest in his work. Yeah, like like Bray is kind of it's a it's a savant quality of his taste that other collectors do not um, dismiss. You know what I mean? Like John Stanley. Go where the wind is blowing, and and uh, they follow right behind Glenn Bray. This is neat. So this is a section of unknown artists, uh, people that he was attracted to their work or whatever from thrift stores and you know places where he didn't connect any more information except something about this piece or that piece uh, drew him to it. And some of them are credited, but it's just somebody that you know I guess he doesn't know anything about, or maybe they don't have a a, uh, a presence. Or they don't like have that. a. Uh, a curriculum vitae or whatever it's called. These are some of those, um, like the paintings. Oh man, I don't know where these are from, like Ghanaian movie posters. So there's an Instagram account I follow of that where they're just done kind of on site to promote whatever movie or whatever showing there, but they're really interesting. You know, they're off model, but they're sort of related. You can definitely recognize, especially if it's something I, you know, an iconic movie like an alien or something. That's great. Uh <laughs> Slim Pickens on my Charles Dickens. And when you see some when you see stuff like this, this lets you know the authenticity of Glenn Bray as a as a patron of the arts, man, because he's not just being a name whore. This is one of their flourishes in the book. This is an eight by fifty nine inch, it's called Street Scene Bob Vandenborn. And so they I assume this is, you know, the actual size piece. And uh Shades of Shadow Hawk uh <laughs> pull out cover but one of the flourishes in a book that really is kind of all flourish yeah it's funny i didn't even bust that out i don't i didn't notice it the first time i went through the book because usually i run out of gas part way through this book it is exhausting my eyeballs will be sore after this i think you'll be okay i'm gonna tough it out bill ward yeah, classic cartoonist, cheesecake artist, man. I, I learned about Bill Ward from uh, Overstreet Part Price Guide in 1982, did a piece on him. Wow, it's so weird. That's how you would come up Just with from that. the flea market. Uh, Chris Ware. Great Beautiful covers, Chris Ware man. pieces. Yeah, you get a Chris Ware, man. You want, you want as much lettering as possible. Rocket Sam. That's incredible, like those lines. And Chris Ware draws gigantic, too, man. So those are big pieces. Yeah, those would be nice to see in person. You know one function of a Ogden book, Whitney. One function I, of a book like this. I saw like this, this on eBay when it went through in the early two thousands. I it, know who sold it, and I, and I guess this is who bought it. And I just looked at it longingly. This book for Glenn Bray can be used as an insurance tool mm -hmm. if uh, something were what's that were to happen. You know, heaven forbid or whatever, man. But uh, it's so hard to insure artwork and to get the true market value and all that stuff, man. Usually, like. If you don't have like a Lloyd's of London sort of insurance account, the the this is worth the paper and the ink it was printed on. But um, if you do have such a insured account or whatever, man, you just have to prove that you have it, and a, he could use this for that. Yeah, and the condition of them, like these things are, man, beautiful. They look like they're in perfect shape. Yeah. Uh, so we're getting into the Robert Williams section. Who he's friends, you know, friends with Robert Williams wrote the intro to this book and talk about. Nobody draws comics like this. His ability to capture surfaces and textures, absolutely top of the line, especially like metallic surfaces and things. These are just choice. Bob Layton was trying to say that he brought metallic surfaces <laughs> to uh, Bob Layton <laughs> to uh, to comics, man. Now that you say that, I, I, I've seen those Iron Mans. I, I can see where he's coming from. <laughs> but uh, Robert Williams comics in the early Zaps. Um, would stand out as being just like sort of the best draw. Like even Crumb was playing around and a little bit finicky, and Robert Williams was the guy who was really shining with the artwork. It was just like he did such limited stuff. This is a cover for 1972. You know, like put it in context. Go pull out a couple of 1972 comics and see. It's not even nothing is com comparative to this. Like I don't know if you'd find other illustration that is that much into like Crumb and then sculptures. I, I had no idea Robert Williams did sculpture. Yeah, it seems like he's, you know, so artists have these different makeups, right? Like some of them have to draw all the time. Some of them are sort of creatively, they just are explorers. They just yeah. have to try different things and they see something and it captures their imagination or whatever. He's a handy uh, guy. I mean, he builds hot rods and stuff. 
yeah, you can see that creative stuff just playing with formats and different things that he's that he's messing with. Jimmy Stewart delivery. I got dinner with him once, man, and and uh, when the the cute waitress girl was uh, giving the check and asked us how we were all do how how our experience was, he said, "You want to know what the best part of the entire uh, the entire meal was?" And she said, "What?" He said. The service as she melted. <laughs> I seen it. That's good. I, if you hadn't said it on camera, man, I might <laughs> might use that in the future. Uh, Skip Williamson, another underground guy. Carl Wills, do you know him? No. I was digging this whenever I went through it. I don't know his work either, but looking at some of his work, especially this stuff, the Jessica of the Schoolyard, I was really uh, kind of impressed by it. And I don't know too much more about it, but I I like his work, and I I don't know. uh, It might be coming from a fine art background or something. And this has uh, Mm post-2000s dates of creation, so it's not old stuff. Yeah, the fact that it's post-2000 and it's something I'm interested in and don't know makes me think it's outside of the comics world somewhere. But attractive art. Is that Johnny Ryan with the man? Yeah. Yeah, it is. The fact that those two are laughing laughing together on the couch makes me think. And I think it's a real deal that they're looking at. Johnny Ryan perfect. has, like, he he brought sort of real deal to the kind of masses in a lot of ways, man. Like, that shit was pretty underground for a while, and it was Johnny Ryan who popularized that. This is a beautiful part of the book. This is getting into the S. Clay Wilson section. So if you're into S. Clay Wilson at all, like, this is probably a place where you can see more of his original art than maybe any other publication I can think of. And it, you know, it kind of runs the gamut. There's a really good selection of different stuff in here. And there's, there's a guy that draws or drew and getting into some of like, you know, children's comics, right? Like 1955, when a lot of this stuff is seventies, you know, going back to those, those earlier days, 1956, 1955. So I think he may talk about this stuff in the beginning, too, because I, I know I've read about this and him getting like there was like a trunk full that he had. And so, you know, getting some of that work to preserve it, um, I think that's probably in the intro here. But man, that's Clay Wilson. Wow. Um, Basil Wolverton, the other, you know, like the 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 yin to the Harvey Kurtzman's yang for Glenn Bray, the collector. And you can see there's a lot of Wolverton photos scattered throughout. So again, I think probably a friendship struck up between collector and artist. And uh, I think he became a real patron because he talks about that in the intro of just like encouraging Wolverton to draw, you know, and, and draw stuff and I'll buy it from you directly. Uh, these are incredible. Like the, the biblical drawings and stuff. Like what a mind. Look at those buildings, man. Just unreal. Four, so 14 and a half by 21 and a half. That's that two up size that we've seen a few of the bigger pieces are about that size. I, th- I think he would often use the uh, that 102 nib. And we uh, were fortunate enough to go visit the Billy Ireland and go see uh, some of his originals that are on hand there. There's a close up of that piece. Nice. Um, to show you some of the pen marks. Nice. And uh, use Strathmore yeah, like 500. Right and he would draw over, like, they, they would have that stamp of, you know, Strathmore yeah. stamp, and he would just draw right over top of that stamp. There it is, man. That's another one of those super iconic covers. Really cool that he has that. Fanographics has put out a couple of um, books on Wolverton lately that are going through, like, his life and work chronologically. Really top-notch stuff. You know, if you're a Wolverton fan, and he feels like the guy, you know, like, of those early cartoonists. Like, Fletcher Hanks, I often think of as having some similarities but he doesn't have the body of work. You know, it's a, it's a very small piece compared to like Wolverton did everything. That's really awesome. Wally Wood. <laughs> it just doesn't stop. It yeah. just doesn't stop. I've never seen this piece before. Really cool. I don't know what that's from. But then like this is that iconic, the three, di- three dimensions where the guy's falling out of the panel and ripping pieces off as he goes and distorting that panel that would have looked like a room until you pull on it a little bit and then realize it's this... <laughs> it's, that's a great, that's, that's one of those super influential to me of like thinking about formal elements of a page. There, this is going to be a whole episode uh, at some point when we examine kind of, I don't want to give it away, man, because there, there's other YouTubes that will try to steal the idea, man, <laughs> but uh, that, there's an episode and that, and that page will show up. Jim Woodring, so this is some of the, the graphite-like stuff that I was talking about and some of the grayscale stuff we saw earlier that I say could be, cre- uh, could be put together. Do you know XNO? No, but his stuff is really cool. I have some comics of his. He would do like mini comics and some some off the uh, off the main trail kind of stuff. 
Robert Young. I don't know what Bob Zoel. I don't, I don't, Zoe. Yeah, me neither, man, but it's really cool. Reminds me a little bit of Chris Ware with some of the diagrammatic stuff. Yeah. The precision. Like that. That's really awesome. That's really a nice piece. Love when guys can capture motion. Boom. There it is, man. I've, uh, in, in, in my day, I've bit acquired some comic collections from other people. So you get, you know, two, three long boxes, eight long boxes from somebody. You go through every single issue and you could build a little bit of a psychological mm -hmm. profile of that person's tastes, what they're interested in, perhaps even the kind of person that they are. You know, you can make some educated guesses with the context clues of what you were looking at, man. And uh, looking at a book like this, the only takeaway that, that I could have by looking at his collection, yeah, is uh, a dude that just has has impeccable taste and uh, giving the context of some of this stuff in his early fandom, people were shunned for even reading a comic. So spending any money on a piece of original artwork was counterculture. And this guy, and, and in the true sense of the word, like this dude was not trying to fit in to any kind of like mainstream whatsoever. And I give him a lot of props for that. Yeah, you wonder the psychological positive impact he would have. Um, you know, you mentioned Alvin Buenaventura, yeah. uh, who worked closely with Dan Klaus and several other cartoonists. And you've heard those cartoonists talk about the impact that he had on them, you know, like thinking of their work differently and treating it differently and, and you know, really thinking of it as art and, and putting it, connecting it in that world or, or contextualizing it that way. Glenn Bray probably did that for a lot of these people because it does feel like there are relationships. It's not just, I got a really cool drawing from this guy. You see, you have stories in the annotations, you see photos of them together. It had to have a positive impact. And, you know, like I think of someone like a Basil Wolverton, if you read those fanographic books, like that is a guy that was not appreciated in his time for the work he was doing. And I'm sure that when somebody comes along and really celebrates it, it has to have, you know, a positive impact on those people's lives. My, uh, my earliest collaborations with Jay Lynch and with Harvey Pekar, uh, I think exhibit a little bit of what you were saying, man. And, and so I could kind of speak to the, the impact. These, like, like Jay Lynch, who didn't make a comic for about 20, 30 years when I got in touch with him, it sort of blew his mind that anybody gave a fuck. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And I'm sure Glenn Bray uh, gave gave these guys a little pep in their step to uh, just let them know that, you know, the, the work transmitted and sort of did what it was supposed to. You know, you and I, we make stuff. It's very weird. You you At this point, you just hit buttons on the computer and then a book will show up in three months. You know what I mean? You don't ha exactly have any idea what's happening. Uh, how it's being received. You can read little tweets and shit, but what's 180 characters for something you spent a year making? It's very true. And it's sad in a way that th that we could probably list a dozen, we might be able to get to a dozen patrons of the arts in comics history who, who had that kind of impact, you know, that had like a, I don't know, a personal connection to an artist and really kind of boosted them. I think of Spurgeon as one of these guys, you mm -hmm. know, like, like it, it's not a long list, unfortunately, but people watching at home, you know, that's one of the little acts of gratitude that'll make your life better and the person's life better that, that you admire their work or whatever is letting them know that, you know, it doesn't take anything to, to say, Hey man, I read your comics through a dark period or, or they really boosted me in some way. Um, these are nice things, nice gestures to do. So I would say uh, that's one takeaway from an episode like this is, is let these artists know that it means something to you. Let them know that it means something while you still can, you know, pe people don't live forever. So let them know the impact they have because, uh, man, comics saved my life in a lot of ways. Like there were some dark moments where the comics were the only thing I was looking forward to. And it's great when we get to talk to these artists, you know, talking to Steve Bissett had a little bit of that impact, talking to Tim Truman, you know, like some of these guys, it's like, I read your comics when I was at my lowest point. So um, it, it's nice for them to hear it. And uh, I would say that's something everybody, we could all do a little bit better. Jimmy, now I got to digest this new. <laughs> this is a have. lot. I, I, I've been through this book, Ed, completely, probably half a dozen times over the last couple of years. And it still just feels, it, it's, there's so much in it. 
I can't recommend the book enough, especially for fans of artist editions and things. There's so much great stuff in this book, but I do have to, <laughs> it takes me a while. It's, it's going to be processing. You know how they say the word moist is a gross word? Yes. Uh, an, uh, another gross word to me is a uh, splay. <laughs> Let's get out of here, man. We're getting loopy. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon. We'll notify you when the next videos are available. We're on that race to 20,000 subscribers. So if you haven't uh, jumped on board, make sure you do so. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merchandise and t-shirts at the links below this video. Jimmy, I need to go hit up Eric Reynolds at Fantagraphics. Try to get Mr. Bray's contact information, man. Give these dudes their marching orders. Read more comics. <laughs>